Good morning. Good morning. And as Luke had already pointed out at the beginning of service, we are very glad for the presence that we do have a pretty good number of visitors with us. And we're always happy to have visitors and those that take time to worship God with us. And uh, particularly today from the standpoint, as Luke also mentioned, we do have a lot of people uh, that have taken advantage of the long weekend and uh, are out of town. Also have uh, a number of people that are some fighting some uh, illnesses, but just uh, a good number of our own are not able to be here today. Uh, and I was thinking about that earlier too, and the thought occurred to me that with Vicki, and Vicki's just, she brought, she felt it coming on Thursday, and Friday felt miserable, and yesterday was horrible, and she took on a cold, a bad cold, and, and I was thinking about it earlier this morning, and I thought, she and I have been sitting side by side at church services, at assembly worship, since we were 16 years old, because we started dating when we were 16, and they're in Cayucas, and we always sat together, and uh, I've rather grown accustomed to that, of her sitting by my side, and so when she's not here, it just, it just, and she always serves as a great cushion between Annette and myself, too, but in any case, <laughs> but that's another story. I want to also suggest to you that to really be thinking about this, too, because I'm really looking forward to tonight's lesson that Dennis is going to be giving on dealing with the voyage of life, and he actually is going to have, I think, what's going to be an interesting illustration I don't want to give away too much, but there's going to be something even quite physical that's going to be set up in the foyer. So okay if I, I can ask okay if I say that, but I said it. But anyway, but I'm really looking forward to it. And Dennis just always does a great job in the presentation of Scripture and to make us think. And so uh, uh, that's going to be, of course, tonight at, at 6 o'clock. And one other announcement, and with great joy we announce, many of you have met in uh, the recent couple of months, few months, I guess, the way time goes, but uh, Zach Anderson Yoxemeyer, and uh, he's a good friend, actually works with Chris Sylvester, who we baptized a number of months ago. And uh, in fact, Chris and Vance are up in North Dakota right now and went, landed in Fargo, and then they worshiped across the border in Minnesota this morning, and they already sent a picture of the church building where they worshiped this morning. They're a couple hours ahead of us, and so they're having lunch while we're, you know, doing this. But... Chris, a brand new Christian, to be with Vance. That's an awesome thing, that you travel so far and find a place to worship and go, and they did. Well, you've met, many of you have met Zach, and we've been studying with Zach, we've been studying with him, and happy now that this past Tuesday that Zach was baptized in Christ. And so we are just uh, overjoyed with that. Uh, saw him last night. He had to leave early this morning as he had a, a, radio, a radio broadcast to do in Los Angeles this morning. But he'll be attending in Santa Monica tonight with Jay Holloway. Many of us have met Jay before, too. And so they're hooking it up. And, and I'm, just, I'm just so pleased that these young men have not only responded to the gospel, but being very young in the faith and going to the places that they go, find places to worship. You know what? That is something that's very, very wonderful. And it's a good example for everybody, isn't it? So I just wanted to share that with you. Appreciate the reading that Donnie did, kind of the lengthy reading. And as we're going to be looking indeed at the parable of the sower in Luke chapter 8. And one thing we understand is that the parable of the sower is Jesus' first parable. It's his first parable. And as he used this method, this parabolic method of teaching, parabolus is just the idea of, of placing a couple of things side by side. But what Jesus would do is he would use a physical illustration or analogy. And it was always something that people could relate to. And in fact, when you study all of the parables of Jesus, they were situations or things that actually could and did happen. In other words, it wasn't some kind of mythological, fanciful, folklore thing. It was something that actually could and did happen that people could relate to, even as we're going to see in the parable of the sword. But the intention was to take a physical analogy to do what? To make a spiritual application and to teach a lesson. And so Jesus uses this method and, and he explains to the disciples who ask him, why do you teach with these parables? And of course, isn't it so true, as we brought out in last Sunday evening's sermon, that we look at so many people in the world and there are none so blind as those who will not see and even though Jesus could give teaching of parables that were these great illustrations, 
that make sense to people that want to know the truth. And yet so many of the enemies of Christ, particularly the scribes and the Pharisees, they didn't understand what he's talking about. And I suppose they looked at it as, as pure foolishness. But Jesus wanted his disciples, upon hearing these parables, to do so, yes, with receptive and perceptive ears or attention. To know that there are valuable lessons to be taught within this. Now, there are so many things that we could say about the parable of the sower. And I want to obviously speak about some of the main points of the parable. But basically, two things are emphasized. And even as I have referred to or entitled this particular lesson, the seed and the soil. And the first thing that kind of stands out in my mind in an analysis of the parable of the sower is this point. That the seed is emphasized more than the sower. Now, don't get me wrong. There needs to be sowers. And even in the application, we have this seed. And the seed is identified in verse 11 as the Word of God. Now, the seed is the Word of God. Well, that's why it takes emphasis, because the seed is the Word of God. Who need to be the sowers? Do we not need to be the sowers, even as Jesus would commission his apostles to go out and sow the seed? I'm not saying that that's not important. It is critically important. But do recognize that there is an emphasis of the seed. This emphasis of the seed. You find this in Scripture a lot. Two other cross-references that I thought about a little while ago that, that we would find in reference to this. In 1 Peter chapter 1, there Peter reminds these Christians, since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. The imperishable seed through the living and abiding Word of God. That's what 1 Peter 2.23 says. No wonder Jesus says in his explanation, now the seed is the Word of God. The Apostle John would note in his first epistle, in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 9, he says, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Well, Peter said, those that are born of God, they have been born of God because of this imperishable seed, the living and abiding word of God. Understand the emphasis of the seed, the seed. Jesus said in Luke 8, 11, now the seed is the word of God. This is the emphasis, and we have this in our possession today. But when we talk about the soil, and actually in reality, four soils that are given within the parable, the soils illustrate the various heart conditions, don't they? That as the seed is sown, that as the seed is spread out, we even talked about this in the adult Bible class this morning, that of these kinds of illustrations and analogies, very agrarian, the people lived, they, they understood these agricultural terms and could just envision that a farmer going out and with this large bag that was strapped about his body and reaching out and indiscriminately taking the seed and sowing, throwing that seed, and that seed is going to fall again indiscriminately in different parts and places of the field. We can envision that. So here's what Jesus is doing, of course. The seed, which is the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, basically, that it is going to be sown. And this seed, when it is sown, and when we take it out of the world, this seed is going to be sown in lots of different, to lots of different people. And the various kinds of soils that Jesus will talk about is the condition of one's heart. What kind of heart do people, what kind of hearts do people possess? And that's what all of us, even individually, need to ask and answer for ourselves. So in verses 12 through 15, he speaks about those four soils. The four type of soils that are seen. And I want us to understand that they're seen in the world and they're seen even within the church today. These attitudes or heart conditions that exist. And it's very, really important, critically important that we get in the teaching of Jesus. So let's begin as we would emphasize in verse number 12. As Jesus talks about what we'll simply identify as the wayside soil. And what does he say in verse 12? Here's his explanation. Now again, he just said in verse 11, the seed is the word of God. Then he says in verse 12, the ones along the path, 
You may, you may have had a translation that said that seed came upon the path, the wayside. It is this hardened road. He says, the ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Jesus speaks about a preconditioned situation here because of this path. And when we can imagine, again, in the physical analogy and trying to envision this, that here we see that out in these, out in this, in these farming areas where there would be acreage of, of farmland and all these various conditions, but that they would have roads or paths that they would take to be able to go. And as they would make these trails or these paths, where they consistently, continually walked, what would be the condition of that pathway, the ground? It would become very, very hard. So that when the seed would be indiscriminately thrown and it lands on that hardened pathway, is that seed going to be able to penetrate the soil? It is not. It's just not going to happen. And so this is what Jesus is dealing with. The soil here is impervious. It is impervious because of this hardness. So when we get right to the spiritual application of this. What Jesus is certainly showing is that the soil, that this wayside soil, this kind of a heart, this soil is impervious to the teaching of God's word. The heart is hardened. It is callous. It is impenetrable, even by God's word. You know, the, the word of God has also been likened to a hammer. And I tell you, but even there, it has the ability to break open the heart, but one has to be open. They have to listen. They have to have the right reception of it. And so this certainly applies to the unbeliever, for example, who has no interest in Jesus Christ, who rejects the, the, the teachings of the saving gospel. We talked about Romans 1, 16 and 17, the adult Bible class also, because we were defining righteousness. And remember Romans 1, 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, also the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, even as is written the just shall live by faith. Now this gospel has been for all. Jesus commissions the apostles in Matthew 28 and Mark 16 to go into all the world and preach the gospel everywhere, right? But as it's being preached, there are always going to be a number, in fact, sadly, a large number of people whose hearts are impervious. And they have no interest, no care about the gospel. They only care about the world. What they care about is that which is very self-serving. And so this is a heart condition that is a woeful one. It is one that the Apostle Paul really refers to when Paul writes his first letter to the Thessalonians. And in 1 Thessalonians, rather 2 Thessalonians, second letter, and 2 Thessalonians, but the first chapter, here's what he says to those that won't receive it, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8, and he says, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God, that is, they're not in a relationship with God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. There's just no doubt that Jesus is certainly referring to this, these kinds of hearts. People that, again, will not allow the seed, which is the Word of God, to penetrate their hardened heart and be open and receptive to the truth of the gospel. How sad is that? I'll tell you, this seems to very much be the condition of Felix's heart. When Paul had an opportunity to preach to the Roman governor, Felix, remember we read about that in Acts 24. And as Paul is reasoning about righteousness and self-control and judgment to come, important matters. Felix was alarmed. He trembled and said, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I'll summon for you. I want to tell you, his heart was hard and he was not. He didn't even want to listen to it at that time. Go away. Have you ever tried to talk with somebody, maybe somebody that you work with or a family member, somebody that you know, and you just want to share the gospel with them, but yet they have no desire at all. People that might even say, you know, I love being with you and visiting in time, but leave your Bible at home. It happens. This is that wayside soil. But here's the question that I want to pose. Can the believer have a change of heart as well, and then end up taking on an evil heart of unbelief. I want you to turn over to Hebrews chapter 3, please. Hebrews chapter 3. 
And in Hebrews chapter 3, here the inspired writer is writing to Christians, reminding them about the superiority of Christ and why we are to be in relationship with God through, exclusively through Jesus Christ. Because there were some that had diverted. There are some that had left the faith. And it's very troubling. And so he's going to use an example in Hebrews chapter 3. And this is going to come up a few times in the book of Hebrews. And he's going to go back and talk about the nation of Israel, the Hebrew people. The people of God. The people who witnessed the work of God. I mean, delivered them from Egyptian bondage. Passed through the Red Sea. See those ten plagues. All of this, they're witnesses, and yet they will defect, and they're going to take on this evil heart of unbelief. Just notice verses 12 and 13. This is what he is talking about. And here's what the writer says, Hebrews 3, 3, 12. And notice to Christians, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another, Every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. I'm going to ask you that even when the Hebrew people at times took on that evil heart of unbelief, that's what he's referring to and saying now it can happen to you as Christians. I'm going to ask you, did they become atheists? Did they just quit believing in the existence of God? Not at all. The evil unbelieving heart was not that they stopped believing that God existed. In fact, they'd probably say, oh, yes, no. In fact, even in the murmurings, they appealed to him. But who did they stop trusting? Who did they stop putting their confidence in? And brethren, we need to understand that any time that we take our focus off God, we stop trusting God, having confidence in God, that becomes an evil heart of unbelief in departing or falling away from the living God. And what, there are those that sadly have even allowed their hearts to become hardened for whatever reasons. Though they may have obeyed the gospel, but they, for various reasons. Members of the church whose faith has grown cold and whose hearing has become dull manifest this wayside soil. And subsequently, Satan is able to snatch away the teaching that they had heard, perhaps even for years. They say, oh, I've heard it before. And it really doesn't apply to me. Or apathy just sets in and they stop caring. They don't care anymore. That is sad. The wayside soil will not take to heart sermons preached. After all, it's really for somebody else. And I don't need this. Have we ever seen those kinds of attitudes? And it's sad if it happens. All I can say, brother, is that I hope none of us are this hardened wayside soil. That we will not allow our hearts, our minds to become calloused, hardened in that way. Jesus speaks of that danger and the reality of it. But then he moves on. And he moves on. And look now at verse 13 of the rocky soil there in Luke chapter 8. And in verse 13, there he says, And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root. They believe for a while. And in time of testing, they fall away. First of all, I'm just amazed by reading the passages we already have. And then reading a passage like this. To how those that in the so-called world of Christendom today can even hold a view that it's impossible to fall away from the Lord. I, I just, I'm telling you, I don't get it at all when you read these kinds of passages and some of those Calvinistic thoughts that exist today. But what is Jesus talking about? There again, we look at the dynamic of it, and he's sowing that seed indiscriminately, this farmer. And yes, some hit that pathway, that way, said so. But then here, there are areas which were just inundated with rocks. You know, much of the land that we're talking about in Canaan and other parts of that old world there, that they had this, and, and, and we would take painstaking efforts in, in, in our country today with mechanization to be able to remove every large stone or rock that we could to have more good soil. But I tell you what, that was not always a thing to do, and there were certain areas that were just filled with rocks and deep with rocks, but here the sea would fall, but there'd be some soil. And that seed would penetrate. And that seed would germinate. 
And that seed would take root a little bit and it would sprout up and there would sprout up. But what's happening? And so the soil, because of the rocks, is shallow as it is crowded between the hard rocks. Oh, Jesus indicates that it sprang up quickly. But without proper enduring rooting, the hot sun severely scorches the young tender plant. And with no moisture, it soon withered away. Unlike the wayside soil, this heart is actually curious and listens to God's word. And there's an immediate response that says, even with what? Joy. Isn't that interesting? Receive with joy. I'm going to tell you, I've been there. I've seen that with people. One of the most devastating things to me is a very young, young man for the first time that had an opportunity to teach somebody one-on-one. -on -one. In fact, I took him through, I, I took him through the What Shall I Believe series this before I was even in the training program. But I was taking him through a, a, something very similar to, the, to, to that uh, of the What Shall I Believe series. It wasn't the exact one. But, but went through this, and this, this fellow I went to school with, we went to elementary school, high school together, we played football together, he was one year ahead of me, and I tell you, he was so excited, and, and he said, man, and, and it was raining cats and dogs, and he's living, I was talking to him, we're living, and he was living in an apartment in San Luis Obispo, and he says, I need to be baptized, and, and, and we're driving to Cayucas to the baptistry, he says, oh Brent, be careful, drive careful, I don't want to get in an accident, right? Great joy. Now this was on a Saturday afternoon. He is baptized. My father-in-law, Paul Fields, he comes and opens the building. We, we, we make sure there's the water in the baptistry. Vicki comes to it. Vicki and I had just been only married for a year or two. Never saw him again. Never saw him again as far as... I worked with him. Guess where? But anyway, I worked with him. But as far as when it came to worship in church and said, well, we'll continue on with studies. Never, ever again. And started avoiding me like the plague. I'm going to tell you that he felt this conviction of sin with joy. I mean, I'll never forget. It was raining hard. Brent, drive carefully. Okay. We look at this, and, 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 and there's a lot, and there may be a lot of reasons with this, but one thing that Jesus addresses is this. Whoever is in a condition that Jesus is talking about, that there's this lack of depth, and with no depth, with no good root system, no real conviction, and a failure to get involved, to get involved with Bible study, and to get involved with the Lord's church. So it doesn't even have to be the person that, you know, obeys the gospel on a Saturday and then doesn't even worship on Sunday and never be seen again. That's kind of, I understand that's kind of an extreme thing, but, but I want to tell you what, did you think that left a lasting thought, impression in my mind? I'll never forget it. But that happens with people that maybe they, they are coming and they, their worship and their Bible classes and then pretty soon and maybe not much time goes by and the weakened Christian soon falls away. I wonder if that's the heart condition that uh, various brethren in the province of Galatia that Paul had to deal with. And, and they, they found themselves, they chased off to perverted teaching. And Galatians 1, he says, I am shocked, I am amazed with some of you that how soon, listen to it, how soon removed you are to another gospel. You know who they were taught by, many of them? The Apostle Paul. See, I go back to the situation I was telling you about. I was a 21-year-old kid, didn't know anything. Tried to do the best I could. We're talking about people in Galatia that had been taught by Paul, many of them. He says, I'm shocked that you're so soon removed to another gospel, which is not a go another gospel because there's only one, isn't there? But though we are an angel from heaven, would teach or preach any of the gospel that which you have received, let him be accursed. Have that, and what a warning that is. And all I can say, brethren, and should there be this time of testing, because that's what he's talking about. But these have no root. They believe for a while, and a time of testing fall away. Should there be any because of the time of testing, they fall away. And I'll tell you, we go back to the Hebrew writer, but now in chapter 10, in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 38, he warns, now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone shrinks back, I will not be pleased with them. I will not be pleased with them. And there's some that do. They shrink. Their faith 
shrinks back even to destruction or perdition. We need, my friends and brethren, listen please, we need to be prepared for challenges and difficulties and even persecution, times of testing. What did Paul say in his last letter, shortly before he dies, and he's in prison knowing he's going to be executed. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, he says, Yes, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer what? Persecution. It's going to happen. When you take a stand and you do the right thing, it's going to happen. But then we cannot allow the devil to enter in again because of his lack of death. Let none of us become such rocky soil that Jesus isn't done then he talks about this thorny soil. Look at verse 14 of our original text in Luke chapter 8. And he says, And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life. And their fruit does not mature. Again, we look at the physical dynamic of what's going on and sowing that seed, sowing and scattering that seed. Wayside, rocky, and then here are some areas that were just absolutely inundated with thorns and thistles and you know and I can only imagine we've got this out in the back some area that's lousy and it we've I think we've pretty well got it controlled. But it's called I think coyote bush that was called. The only thing that make that stuff worse is if it had thorns and thistles on it. Because I'll tell you, the root system, and it's just tough, and we have to, and it's just amazing. And can, you can imagine where the seed falls with these thorns and thistles and those kinds of things going on. I remember going to this one area in, in Zimbabwe, and, and John pointed out to me, and, and, and in fact, there they, they, they call it, they call it the crown of thorns. It's not really the same variety probably that was used for for Jesus' crown, but that's what they call it. That's what the locals call it, the crown. Now, but I saw areas where we had to be careful where we walked to walk through because of these thorns were everywhere. Number one, I can imagine just saying what we're going to do is before we plant here, we're going to have to try to eradicate all this stuff. Okay? I'm going to tell you what, I would have been work. So they probably have these areas, but man, they're scattering the seed. And some of the seed is going to fall upon these thorny areas. Absolutely. We see that. But what, just, what does Jesus show here? What is he making clear? This soil appears to be good, but because it's inundated with thorns left in the ground, the planted seed sinks deep. It looks very promising. But what happened? Perhaps the pre-existing thorns had been cut off, but only at the surface. You ever done them, certain things in the yard? And if you just cut them off at the surface and don't get the root out of there, man, I'll tell you, what is that lousy grass we have in, uh, in the Central Coast here that sends out those long... Bermuda. Hate that stuff. I tell you what, you, you got you to gotta, you gotta get the root system out. But you talk about work, Right? But maybe what happened is the thorns have been cut off, but the dangerous roots remain below the surface and began to grow again. But when the thorns sprung, sprang up, Jesus said, they absorbed most of the nourishment. That's what would happen. And, and they grew up stronger and they took away much of the sunlight. You can see they're taking moisture, they're taking away the sunlight as the seed, which is, has finally come up from, and, and is being produced. But I'll tell you what, it's not going to work. And so if it was wheat, for example, the wheat, and it didn't completely wither and die, but it was choked enough before it just withered and died. It actually was choked. It was even choked beneath the surface, probably. And it failed to bear, pro bear proper fruit. My friends, I think we see that Jesus is alluding to people that have heard and they've obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, but now in time and whatever the situation is, have allowed the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life to impair their spiritual growth. And I'll tell you what, this spirituality that they had to begin with and should be developing is choked out of them. Could this have been, could this have been Demas? What does Paul say about Demas in 2 Timothy 4.10? 
He says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved what? This present world. What did John say about loving the world in 1 John 2, 15? Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. For if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is of the world that is passing away. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Could this have been Demas in so many respects? The pleasures of life and the inordinate desire to have wealth chokes out true spirituality. No wonder Paul warns that the, that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil as he makes that charge and warning in 1 Timothy 6, 9. He says, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. I want to ask you, are Christians exempt from that warning? No, it's given to Christians. Down in verse 19, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on, on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides you with everything to enjoy. There again, put your hope and trust in God, not in the things of this world. It's not about the houses we live in and the cars that we drive and the salary that we make and the 401ks that we have or whatever else that we seem to just find ourselves consumed with. I want to tell you, the devil knows how to use that thorn. We must be careful not to become thorny soil. It's all a matter of the condition of our heart. So we see this wayside soil, this rocky soil, this thorny soil, but it brings us to what Jesus wants them to understand and what he wants them to become, what he wants us to become, and that's the good soil. Verse 15, back in our text, as for that and the good soil, there are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. In fact, when he gave the actual parable originally up there, when he talked about the soil, he says it produced a hundredfold, a bountiful crop, very bountiful. There is so much good in this ground. The soil, the soft, deep, fertile, thorn-free. It doesn't mean that it's a life that's not going to encounter challenges and problems because 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is temptation common to all people. Oh, well, it is. But now, dealing with temptation. Dealing with trials and challenges in life. And not just the temptation to commit some specific sin. And, and, and so much of this, there are so many different kinds or categories of sin. But just where Satan wants us to be misdirected. He wants us to take our focus off of Christ. Understand, it's why we have to have good condition hearts. We need to have this good soiled heart. So that when these times come, we can face it. We can face it. You see, this good soil, it's in contrast with the wayside soil. Because the good soil receives God's teaching with complete honesty and application. It reminds us of those noble Bereans in Acts 17 11. They were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? Because they received the word of God with all readiness of mind. And what else did they do? They searched the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Acts 17 11. The good soil is in contrast with the rocky soil. The good soil can take the heat of persecution and will not allow the various trials of this life to destroy it. When Paul speaks about that and tries in this very positive way to let the Roman Christians know there in Romans chapter 8, he wants them to understand that yes, we're going to have trials. Yes, there's going to be temptation. Yes, there's going to be persecution. He says, but what should we say to these things? If God is for us, what? He asked, who can be against us? He that is God who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he also not with him graciously give us all things? If God was willing to have Jesus go through what he went through, with what Tim dealt with before we partook of the Lord's Supper today, if God was willing to have Jesus go through that, 
Do you suppose God is willing to help us deal with this life? It would be unthinkable and congruous to think otherwise. He says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, all of us in Romans 8. He says, listen, there's nothing that can take us away from the love of Christ unless we let it. And I'll tell you what, this good soil is also in contrast, obviously, with the thorny soil. Because the good soil makes good choices, regardless of what the world offers by, by virtue of wealth and pleasure. This good soil makes good choices. Begin to look sometimes at individuals and we think, why are you making those choices? Especially as a member of the body of Jesus Christ, as a Christian who has been sanctified by the blood of Jesus, why would you make those kinds of choices? And the problem is a heart condition. But this good soil, you know what it's reminiscent of? It's reminiscent of Moses. Remember what the Hebrew, back at the Hebrew writer, but now in Hebrews chapter 11. He says, by faith, in verse 24, by faith when Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting or the passing pleasures of sin. He considered reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. He knew he had the right perspective because he had good, a good heart, good soil. You see, good soil produces good fruit. We say this morning, I am the vine, you are the branches. We understand that that wording of that song is taken right out of John 15. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I am he, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Those that don't abide in us will be thrown away like a branch that withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown to the fire and burned. He said, but if you abide in me and my words, abide in you, whatever you ask, wish, it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you may bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. A proof of discipleship. And it is there that we can put on the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against, against such there is no law. I mean, those, that is what this good soil is going to demonstrate or manifest in our lives every day. My friends, it should be the desire of each of us to be good soil. Well, I'll tell you, I think we, no pun intended, I think we have just kind of barely scratched the surface of the soil, if you will. The four soils represent four different attitudes. Four different attitudes and responses to God's message of truth, the seed. It all depends on the condition of the heart. I want to ask you, what is your heart? We're going to sing an invitation song, and the question of the invitation song is, is a simple one, an important one. Is your heart right with God? Some hearts are hardened and impenetrable. Tragic. Some hearts are shallow and the root of God's word has no real depth. Some hearts are contaminated by the cares and the pleasures and the temptations of this world. But thankfully, some hearts are receptive and when they are, they will produce fruit. Fruit for the Lord. And all I can ask is what kind of soil are you? And is your heart right with God? If we can help you, if we can help you to make that right choice for God. Let that be known at this time as we stand and sing the song that has been sung.